we're going to talk about anatomy and research methods. Can you think of a more exciting title for a chapter? I cannot. I know you're pumped. Get ready, because there are a lot of slides in this one. So let's talk about the vertebrate nervous system. You are a vertebrate. Look to your left, look to your right. You are surrounded by verte vertebrates. Oh, God. Uh, you are surrounded by vertebrates. Thank you. Uh, so the nervous system can be broken up into the central nervous system, which consists of your brain and your spinal cord. That's exactly what they look like, a perfect drawing of both. Then we have your peripheral nervous system, which is basically everything else in your very well-drawn body. Uh, then that peripheral nervous system uh, contains the somatic and autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system controls voluntary muscle movement and conveys sensory information to the central nervous system. The autonomic nervous system controls your heart's intestines and other organs. Did I say hearts like plural? Uh, sorry, nobody's a time lord in this class. I was trying to be inclusive. Controls your heart intestines, and other organs. Hey, okay, so we have the human nervous system. So we have the CNS, the brain and the spinal cord, and then everything else is our peripheral nervous system. We have the somatic in blue, and we have in red. Uh, I know it's a little hard to see, but just so you get a general idea, uh, all these internal organs here. Uh, that is your autonomic nervous system. And then that breaks down even further into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic uh, nervous system expends energy. It's what's active when you're having a fight or flight response. So if there's some stressful, frightening event and you're preparing for it, that's the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system, sometimes referred to as uh, rest and digest, uh, is uh, what conserves energy and is what's more active when your brain and body are at rest. So we're going to talk about a few uh, anatom uh, anatomical terms. And I just want you to know that you should be real familiar with these because if you do, it will make the rest of the class much easier. So take some time to memorize these so that when you hear things like anterior and posterior, you're not thinking about what they mean, right? So first of all, if you're examining a brain, there are different ways to cut it. So if you uh, have a brain and you cut it like this, right? So you cut like the top half off, that is a horizontal cut, right? That's the horizontal plane. If uh, you were looking at me uh, and I took a uh, sword and just like cut you in half, first of all, that would be very rude. Secondly, uh, like I would lose my job. So just so you know, one, social distancing. Two, I'm not going to cut you in half because uh, that feels rude. Uh, that is called a sagittal cut. Uh, then if you are uh, like cutting somebody's just like face off, uh, that is the coronal plane. Uh, that's a coronal cut. So uh, those are the three different ways of slicing the brain to look inside of it. Uh, there are some other terms that you want to be familiar with. I mentioned anterior and posterior. Uh, again, we talked about the uh, anterior and posterior pituitary. Uh, so anterior is closer to the front, and then posterior is closer to the back. You also have the dorsal uh, and lateral, sorry, the dorsal and ventral. Uh, so if you, let's say you had like a dolphin, uh, there we go, there's a dolphin, so good. Uh, the bottom of the dolphin is the ventral, uh, the top is the dorsal. Why? Oh, look at that. Is that a dors dorsal fin? Maybe. Uh, hopefully that makes somebody remember it. So dorsal on top, ventral on the bottom. Uh, and then if something is close to the center, uh, then it is medial. If it's farther away, 
closer to either side, then it's lateral. So if you had two things, right, uh, and uh, this is closer to the center of the brain, it would be the medial thing, and this would be the lateral thing. So here these terms are again with some new ones. Ooh, uh, so we have dorsal and ventral. So remember our, our dolphin friend, uh, that is a real good dolphin. <laughs> so terrible. Uh, then we have anterior towards the front and posterior towards the back. Uh, we have superior or inferior. So superior means above something, uh, inferior means below something, uh, lateral and medial, uh, lateral closer to the side, medial closer to the middle, proximal and distal. Uh, the proximal is located close to something, distal is located further away from something. Uh, then we have ipsilateral and contralateral. Uh, so ipsilateral means that it's on the same side as something. Contralateral means that it's on the opposite side of something. And then we have our coronal, sagittal, and horizontal planes. Here's some other terms to be familiar with uh, when, we, when they come up later. Uh, you'll just be able to go, oh, I've heard that term before. Uh, so don't worry too much right now about the differences. Just get these names in your brain. Uh, the lamina and the column are just sets of cells or cell bodies. Uh, a tract is a set of axons. Nerves, usually we're talking about those in the periphery nervous system uh, coming either from the brain to uh, the muscles or from a sensory organ back to the brain and spine. Uh, then we have a uh, nucleus, which is a cluster of neuron cell bodies. Uh, same with the ganglion. Uh, this is just depending on where it's located. Uh, and then when we're looking at the different uh, little bulbs or um, fissures, or like so, you know, the brain looks like this. It's very wrinkly, right? Uh, so the this would be a gyrus uh, or gyri, multiple gyri. Uh, these little fissures are sulci. Uh, I shouldn't say fissure because if it's a very deep sulci, it's called a fissure. Uh, so our wrinkly brain is composed of uh, gy gyri and sulci, and sometimes very deep sulci are called fissures. Don't forget that your central nervous system is your brain and your spine. The spinal cord is the other part of your central nervous system, and it communicates with your sense organs and muscles, not including the ones that are located in your head. So for example, if I see something, it doesn't make sense for my uh, visual information to pass my brain, go to my spine, and then come back up to my brain. It just goes straight to my brain. The uh, dorsal parts of our spine uh, carry sensory information uh, into the brain, uh, and our ventral roots carry motor information uh, out of the brain through the spine to the rest of the body. Uh, so the uh, cell bodies of our sensory neurons are located in clusters of neurons uh, outside of the spinal cord, the dorsal root ganglia. Ganglia, have you heard that term before? <laughs> <laughs> there are two types of matter that uh, compose your spine. You have gray matter, which is located in the center of the spinal cord, and that is densely packed with cell bodies and dendrites. Then you have white matter, uh, which is a lot of myelinated axons. Those are carrying information from the gray matter to the brain or to other areas of the spinal cord. So here's our ventral side right here, dorsal side over here. We have this bundle of cells, the dorsal root ganglion. Uh, here's a sensory nerve and here is a motor nerve. Uh, so if this were your head up here, right, uh, the uh, ventral uh, would be taking motor information 
uh, to the rest of your body, the dorsal will be bringing sensory information into the body. So over here we have the gray matter, over here we have the white matter. You can see a lot of cell bodies and dendrites in the gray matter, not so much in the white matter. So our autonomic nervous system, part of the periphery, sends and receives messages to regulate your automatic behaviors of the body. So your heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, cats meowing in the background, digestion, etc. This can be broken down into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, for the most part, control the same parts of the body and will tell those parts of the body to do different things. So for example, if you're having a sympathetic nervous response, your heart is going to beat faster. If you're having a parasympathetic nervous response, it's going to beat slower, right? There are three parts of the body that are only controlled by the sympathetic uh, nervous system. These are the muscles that make your hair stand on end, your sweat glands, and your adrenal glands are very tiny in there. But those three are only controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system prepares our body for rigorous activity. It increases our heart rate, blood pressure, and respiration. Uh, so for example, if you were sprinting, then that would be your sympathetic nervous system uh, being active. Or if you were having an anxiety attack, right, uh, because you have that triggered fight or flight response, it is composed of ganglia on the left and right of the spinal cord. Our parasympathetic nervous system does the opposite. It facilitates our vegetative and non-emergency responses. Uh, it is sometimes called the rest and digest, right? Uh, because it's taking care of all the things that don't involve immediate danger, right? Uh, so it decreases functions that are increased by the sympathetic nervous system. So it's doing the opposite. It's dominant during our relaxed states. So hopefully right now you're in a parasympathetic nervous state. Uh, you're not panicked or you're thinking, how am I going to know all this stuff for the quiz? So maybe you're a little sympathetic, right? It is composed of long preganglion axons extending from your spinal cord and short postganglionic fibers that attach to the organs themselves. So uh, that's what's helping it send those signals. So just so you know, when it comes to the neurotransmitters in our autonomic nervous system, our sympathetic nervous system uses norepinephrine, our parasympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine. So let's now talk about the major divisions of the vertebrate brain. We have the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Uh, the hindbrain, or the Robin cephalon, uh, is composed of the medulla, the pons, and the cere uh, cerebellum, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit. Then we have the midbrain, or mesencephalon, uh, which is composed of the tectum, the tegmentum, the superior colliculus, uh, the inferior colliculus, and the substantia nigra. Then we have the three parts of the forebrain, uh, the prosencephalon, the diencephalon, which is the thalamus and the hypothalamus, then the telencephalon, the cerebral cortices, the hippocampus, and the basal ganglia. Just so you can know what other brains look like, here is a fish brain. So we have our hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. So a lot of the structures that we have in our brains, you can see in the brains of other animals, but we're going to have more mass, especially in the forebrain. Uh, so we'll talk more about how that makes a difference for our 
uh, brain's power. Uh, just so you know, there's the optical nerve, which takes in visual information, and the olfactory bulb, which takes in smell information. So there's the hindbrain, which consists of our medulla, our pons, and cerebellum. It's at the end of the brain, the posterior portion. Uh, so the uh, uh, kind of this back end of the brain. Uh, so these structures, uh, the midbrain and the central structures of the brain make up the brain stem. So here's our hindbrain, which looks like a weird alien. Uh, come feed me, I don't know. Uh, so we have our pineal gland, uh, our thalamus, uh, the colliculuses, the colliculi, sorry, uh, our tectum, tegmentum, uh, pons, and then we have the medulla or the medulla oblongata. And then uh, this is going to be the spine down here. So the medulla, which as you saw is just above the spinal cord, is basically an enlarged extension of the spinal cord. Uh, all those vital reflexes that we have, breathing, heart rate, vomiting, salivation, coughing, and sneezing, those are uh, controlled by the medulla. So pretty important. Uh, if you've ever been hungry and you wanted to eat food, right? If you've ever been choking on something uh, or eaten something that you should have, that is what the medulla is doing for you. Right now, uh, you probably weren't thinking about the fact that you're breathing the medulla. Uh, so the cranial nerves allow the medulla to control sensations from the head, muscle movements in the head, and many of our parasympathetic outputs, so the things that are going on. So if you remember, we were talking about how the spine controls a lot of uh, our sensory and mu uh, muscle uh, inputs and outputs uh, in the rest of the body. The medulla is controlling a lot of our sensations and muscle movements in the head, or uh, the, those cranial nerves allow the medulla to do that. So here we have some of the cranial nerves. 2 through 12. Uh, we'll, you'll see in the next slide uh, where all these go to, but you can see that there are a few of them. So again, these are only dealing with the senses and muscles in the face. Uh, so you don't need to know which ones go where, uh, but just you can see that one is for smell, two is for vision, uh, three and four are also for vision. So we have the control of the eye movements and uh, pupil constriction, uh, six as well. Then we have uh, the hearing and equilibrium. Uh, equilibrium. Uh, so the senses from the ears and eight. Uh, so all these different uh, muscle groups and senses from the head are going through these cranial nerves through the brain stem. So on each side of the medulla, our ventral and anterior sides, we have what's called the pons. Uh, the pons, Latin word for bridge, uh, is basically composed of a bunch of axons from each half of the brain that are crossing to the opposite side of the spinal cord. Uh, and the reason for this is because the left part of our brain controls everything on the right side of our body, and everything on the right side of our brain controls the left side of, uh, of the body. So that switch happens at the pons. Now you're probably wondering, why that switch happens. There have been a couple guesses that have been made as to why maybe some common ancestor uh, had a, uh, you know, left to left and right to right, uh, and then something happened where their head switched around to the opposite side, right? Uh, so the that would cause the left to then control the right, and then the right to control the left. But we don't know for sure. 
Uh, it's one of the mysteries of evolution. Uh, but that is just the way that works, and that switch happens at the ponds. Then we have the cerebellum, if you remember from a previous lecture. It's got the most neurons. Uh, it is very deeply folded, and it helps regulate our motor movement, our balance, and our coordination. It also helps us shift attention between auditory and visual stimuli. Then we have the midbrain. It has the tectum, which is the roof of the midbrain, the superior and inferior colliculus, which process sensory information, the tegmentum, which contains nuclei for your cranial nerves and is part of the reticular formation. And then we have substantia nigra, which uh, gives rise to a lot of the dopamine containing pathways, which help us with our movement. So a lot of dopamine creation happens in the substantia nigra. So here we have a sagittal cut of the human brain. Uh, these are a lot of things that we're going to talk about later. So just keep those in mind. Uh, but we have the cerebellum here, and you can see some of those real deep folds that we talked about. Then we have our brain stem, our superior and inferior colloqui, uh, sorry, colliculi. Uh, and yeah, so this is just a nice side cut so you can kind of see things from a different angle and see where everything fits in. So the forebrain is what most people think of when they think of the brain. It's the most prominent part. It's the part that is easiest to see. Uh, this consists of the outer cortices and the subcortical regions. Subcortical just meaning below these cortices. Uh, the outer portion is the cerebral cortex, uh, and each side receives sensory information and controls motor movement from the opposite side, the contralateral side. How does that uh, information switch over from left to right and right to left? If only there were some bridge. There is a bridge. It's the ponds. See, it's all coming together. So here's some views of the brain. This is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. So our cerebellum uh, would be tucked under there. Uh, so here you can see the frontal lobe of the brain, and you can see some of these uh, sulci and gyri that we talked about. Uh, so these little grooves and these bumps, right? Uh, then we have the parietal lobe up top, uh, the occipital lobe uh, in the back, and then on the sides are the temporal lobes. Uh, then we can see uh, everything from the inside. And in here, right, we have our subcortical uh, parts. So we have the basal ganglia, we have the thalamus, the hippocampus, and then we have our ventricles. So our forebrain has our limbic system, which is a bunch of interlinked structures uh, that form a border right around the brain stem. Uh, this is the olfactory bulb, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, the amygdala, the cingulate gyrus uh, of the cerebral cortex. So a lot of these behaviors are kind of our more base uh, behaviors. So our emotions, uh, uh, eating, drinking, sexual activity, anxiety, and aggression. So imagine our brainstem back here, you know, trailing down to the spine. Uh, the cingulate gyrus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus, hypo meaning below thalamus, right? Uh, the mammillary bodies are hippocampus, amygdala, and the olfactory bulbs. So the subcortical regions below the cortices include the thalamus, which is basically the relay station from your sensory organs, uh, and the main source of input from those sensory organs into your cortices. 
And then you also have your hypothalamus, uh, which is controlling your pituitary gland, which will release hormones. And it's also associated with behaviors like eating, drinking, sexual behavior, and other motivated behaviors. Your thalamus and your hypothalamus together form the diencephalon. This just shows how the thalamus is connected to different parts of the brain. So the thalamus is here in the center, and it just sends information to different parts of the brain. We also have the pituitary gland, which, as mentioned before, produces hormones. Uh, then we have the basal ganglia, which is comprised of the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the global pallidus. Uh, this is associated with the planning of motor movement. So if I'm seeing my cat lying right next to me and I want to pet him, uh, that planning happens in the basal ganglia. Also, it's related to aspects of memory and emotional expression. So uh, uh, in addition, uh, uh, attention. So even though there are lots of things in my room that need to be cleaned or organized, or you know, I'm staring at my Xbox right now, just thinking about playing it, but I'm recording this lecture, right? My attention is focused on the lecture because of my basal ganglia. Language planning, also using that right now. Some of you might say, mm, you need a little bit more basal ganglia, Professor Thompson. You need some better language planning because you're not great with the words sometimes. And to that, I would say, wow, that's really hurtful. I'm under a lot of stress. I am making these lectures during a pandemic. Give me a break. <laughs> and uh, the basal ganglia is also related to other cognitive functions. And here we can see the parts of the basal ganglia. Then we have the basal forebrain, which are several structures that are on the dorsal surface uh, of the forebrain, so top. Uh, the, this contains the nucleus the solace. It receives input from the hypothalamus and the basal ganglia sends axons that release acetylcholine to the cerebral cortex, and this is important for arousal, wakefulness, and attention. So over here is our nucleus basalis, and you can see these axons that are branching out to different parts of the brain. Then we have the hippocampus. It's a structure located between the thalamus and cerebral cortex. Uh, this is the memory center of the brain. Uh, so a lot of the formation of new memories, especially memories for individual events, starts here. Then we have our ventricles. These are four fluid-filled cavities that hold cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid is found in the brain, cerebro, and spine, spinal, uh, and it's fluid. That's why it's called cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, it provides some cushioning for the brain, so your head moves around a bit. So make sure that uh, it, it doesn't get damaged just by being in your skull, right? And it's a reservoir of hormones and nutrition for your brain and spinal cord. Then we have our meninges. These are membranes that sur uh, surround our brain and spinal cord. If you've ever heard of meningitis, uh, sorry, meningitis, uh, it is a very painful inflammation of these membranes. Uh, swollen blood vessels in these areas are the cause of migraine headaches. So if you're the per, uh, type of person who suffers from migraines, next time you're having one go, curse you meninges, and it will make you laugh, and then you'll regret laughing because you have a migraine, and they're horrible.
here we can see our ventricles. Uh, here's a nice view of an actual brain. And uh, if this were in your skull, it would be filled with cerebral spinal fluid. It's currently not because it's not in your skull right now. So the cerebral cortex is the most prominent part of the mammalian brain. So you, me, your cat or dog, uh, other, <laughs> I was like, how many other uh, mammals are there? I think just those three, those are the only mammals uh, that exist. Uh, yeah, uh, all mammals have very prominent cerebral cortices. Uh, these are the cellular layers on the outer surface of your cerebral hemispheres. Uh, they divide into two halves and they are joined by a bundle of axons called the corpus callosum and interior commissure. Uh, so these uh, parts help the two sides, left and right, communicate with one another. Uh, and as mentioned before, the cerebral cortices in humans is much more highly developed uh, in our brain than it is in the brain of other species. So if you look at uh, our forebrain as a percentage of our brain mass, uh, so here are some insectivores. Uh, here's a tree shrew right here. It's a good little comparison, right? About half of its brain uh, is its forebrain. For us, about 80% of our brain is our forebrain. So that's a really big difference. And because our brains are also larger, uh, that's going to increase the abilities of our brains. So let's talk about the organization of the cerebral cortex. Uh, it, it contains uh, up to six layers or laminae uh, that are parallel to the surface of the cortex. Uh, those cells are also divided into columns that are perpendicular to the laminae. So this is the surface, right? Then we have our laminae. Oh, this is going to be the best drawing that I've ever drawn, right? And those are stacked uh, parallel to the surface. But then you also have these, it's not as good, um, but uh, these perpendicular uh, 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 columns, right? Uh, so the laminae are the horizontal layers, then you have the perpendicular columns. So here's just an illustration of the six laminae of the human cerebral cortex, uh, the molecular, external granular, pyramidal, internal granular, inner pyramidal, and multiform layer. Not going to get too deep into them. Uh, just understand that the composition of cells changes uh, the deeper you go. And then we have columns, so we can see these long stretches of neurons going from the base to the surface. There are four lobes of the cerebral cortex, the occipital, parietal, temporal, and frontal lobes. So we have the uh, frontal lobe, it is composed of the prefrontal cortex, the motor, and then somesthetic cortex. Uh, so we're getting senses from here. Uh, our motor control is there. And then our prefrontal cortex is responsible for planning and judgment. Then uh, we have the precentral gyrus, uh, which is where the primary motor cortex is, and this central sulcus right there. The uh, post-central gyrus is where this primary somatosensory cortex is, and then we have the parietal lobe. Uh, then in the back, we have the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe on the side. The occipital lobe is there for vision. The temporal lobe is there for hearing and some visual processing. Our occipital lobe is at the end of our cortex, the posterior end. 
uh, so way in the back, right? Uh, it is also known as the striate cortex or the primary visual cortex, and it's responsible for uh, our processing of visual information. If you were to get hit in your occipital lobe, that could result in what's called cortical blindness, where your eyes still work, but your brain can't properly uh, interpret the signals that it's getting from your eyes. Just in case you're wondering why they cross, there's what's called an optic chiasm where information from one eye goes into, uh, half of that information goes into the other side. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Then we have the parietal lobe, which has a postcentral gyrus uh, or the primary somatosensory cortex. This is where our sensations of touch and information from our muscle stretch receptors and joint receptors go. So that feeling of, uh, you know, stretching and like going like, ooh, can my body stretch even more than that? Like if you were to stretch your arms uh, all the way up to the sky, right? That's being processed by your postcentral gyrus. Uh, it's also responsible for processing and integrating information about your eye, head, and body positions from information sent from your muscles and joints. So if you're trying to like look at something or if you see something flying to your face and you're trying to avoid it, right, uh, that's uh, all happening in the postcentral gyrus. Our parietal lobe is also uh, helpful for spatial information as well as numerical information. Uh, so if you want to count with your fingers, that is an overlap of spatial and numerical tasks, right? Uh, you're one, two, three, four, five, or even if you did it with your foot, right? Uh, one, two, <laughs> like when uh, sometimes you see like courses that can count and then that would be their parietal lobe coordinating that information. So these are referred to as the homunculuses of the brain. Uh, so basically we can see where specific sensory or motor information is coming to or go coming from. Uh, so for example, when it comes to our senses, so uh, anything from uh, your uh, intra-abdominal organs is going to be processed in this uh, little area right here. Or if you're, uh, you know, having a toothache, uh, that's going to be in this area here. Uh, if there's ice in your hand, right, uh, that would be processed here. So this uh, homunculus of the brain just shows us what parts are represented. You can actually see that our face composes a very big chunk of that, right? Uh, even here, uh, it's a pretty big chunk of uh, the map for motor cortices. And then also just look at your uh, fingers and hand in comparison to everything down to your trunk, right? Uh, a very small part of uh, your body has a lot of uh, uh, neurons de uh, dedicated to it, right? Uh, and the reason for that is because we do a lot with our hands. Uh, we need to be very precise with our hand movements and our senses from our hands, right? Uh, so, of course, there need to be more neurons there. Same with our face. Then we have our temporal lobes. Those are located on the lateral portions of each hemisphere. So if this is your brain, this is you looking forward over here. These are your temporal lobes right near the temples. Uh, you can think of them as right near the ears because they are where our auditory information is uh, processed as well as they're the key area in which spoken language is processed. They're also responsible for parts of our vision, including movement and some emotional and motivational behaviors. So the frontal lobe has a prefrontal cortex in the precentral 
gyrus. The precentral gyrus is our primary motor cortex, and that's responsible for the control of fine motor movement. If you were typing your notes or uh, writing them, I was like, what's the thing that's not typing? Uh, then your precentral gyrus is responsible for that. Our prefrontal cortex integrates all of our sensory information and information from uh, other areas of the cortex, and it's responsible for our planning and our judgment. So here we can see species differences in the prefrontal cortex. And look, there are other mammals. So there are squirrel monkeys, there are cats, there are rhesus monkeys, there are dogs, chimps, and humans. That's how it's pronounced. Everybody says human. It's actually human. That's not true. Please don't tell that to anybody. Uh, but you can see, right, in these smaller creatures, very small prefrontal cortex. Uh, us humans uh, or humans, uh, we're killing it with those prefrontal cortices. And that's part of the reason why our brains are able to do so many things that other creatures cannot do. So our prefrontal cortex is responsible for a lot of our higher functions, like abstract thinking and planning. So that part of you that's like, what am I doing with my life? Am I happy? Like, is this going to be this way for 10 years? Prefrontal cortex, right? Chimps aren't doing the same thing where they're having existential anxiety and wondering if their friends like them, right? That is all our wonderful human prefrontal cortex. Our ability to remember uh, recent events and information, uh, our working memory is part of the prefrontal cortex. So right now, you're hearing the words that I'm saying. They might not stick with you forever, but for right now, you're able to process what I'm saying. That's the prefrontal cortex giving you the ability to go, oh, yeah, uh, he just said that a second ago, and oh, that reminds me of something, and all that putting things together. Uh, when people experience damage to the prefrontal cortex, they uh, exhibit a uh, de uh, issues with a delayed response task. So uh, they're supposed to respond to something after they see or hear a delay, and they have a much harder time doing that uh, because they don't have that same ability to have cohesive working memory, right? Uh, so that ability to so for example if i said uh remember the word apple wait three seconds what word did i say right hopefully you would say apple if you had damage your prefrontal cortex you might have trouble holding on to that idea right uh so that's prefrontal cortex So science did some bad things sometimes. Back in the 1940s and 50s, we were like, you know what would help people who are suffering from mental illness? Severing a portion of their brain, specifically the prefrontal cortex. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, about 40,000 prefrontal lobotomies were uh, performed. Uh, this was used primarily on people suffering from schizophrenia but it was later used for people with less severe mental illness. Uh, people who got lobotomies were left apathetic. They didn't really have any ability to plan. They had issues with their memory and they lacked emotional expression. Uh, you might be wondering why this was uh, used. Well, it calmed people down. Now, in hindsight, it seems dumb. Uh, and this is why science changes and evolves, right? Uh, so for example, uh, if you have a child who is not sitting still and running around class all the time, right, you're not going to break that child's legs. Uh, there are other ways of dealing with a hyperactive child. So unfortunately, uh, early medicine wasn't very kind to people with mental illness. So they didn't think about the fact that, yes, it calmed them down, but there were possibly better ways 
of treating the, their illness that weren't so permanent and weren't so harmful. So these are not ventricles. These are actually holes in the prefrontal cortex caused by a lobotomy. And just in case it's not clear, you don't want holes in your brain, uh, aside from the ones that are supposed to be there. Uh, it's not like a nose or an ear or a lip. You don't just want to put holes in there for fun. Uh, so uh, uh, lips, noses, uh, uh, belly buttons, you know, whatever. You Whatever else you want to put holes in, you can do that. Uh, your brain, no holes. The ones that are there are enough. Trust me. <laughs> I'm a scientist. So as you might guess, uh, even though we're talking about these different parts of the brain, they're not working independently of one another. They all communicate with each other and they all contribute to who we are and how we behave. No one thing is controlling all parts of the brain. So there is something called the binding problem. There are these different parts of the brain that are doing things relatively independently. So how is it that we have a full understanding of something that's hitting our senses in different ways? So for example, right, uh, you see a cake coming towards you, you smell the cake, uh, your friends are singing happy birthday, right? All these things are related to one specific thing, and we perceive it as a whole experience, not just smells, tastes, sounds, sight, right? Uh, but how does our brain bind that all together? So one uh, idea is that it binds that activity in different areas when they produce uh, waves of activity at the same time. So basically you perceive two different sensations happening at the same time and in the same place. And so that allows your brain to go, okay, these must be connected. Uh, this is what ventriloquists basically do. You see the mouth of the ventriloquist dummy moving uh, while you hear an auditory sensation, the ventriloquist talking, and your brain combines those two, making you think that the dummy is talking. Some of us may have uh, gotten to experience virtual reality gaming, and you might have experienced this binding problem, right? Maybe you thought that something was right behind you, and you turned, right? Now, your brain, part of it doesn't actually realize that you're in a game, which is why you react to things jumping at you uh, in the game as if they were real things because your brain is binding those sensations. Uh, in this, a uh, person was uh, in a little virtual simulation and somebody in the virtual simulation got their back scratched, but they were standing uh, a few feet uh, more forward than the person actually was. And because they saw themselves getting scratched in the back a few feet ahead of where they were actually standing, they perceived themselves as having been further forward than they actually were because their brain was combining that information. You can also fool yourself without virtual reality. If you look at one arm in the mirror and hide the other arm uh, and you clench and unclench, eventually your brain will start thinking that the arm in the mirror is your opposite arm. Brains are weird. When it comes to researching the brain, there are a few things that we might do. Uh, we can examine the effects of brain damage. So when one specific part of the brain is damaged, what happens? Uh, also, we can 
examine what happens when we stimulate a part of the brain. We can record brain activity during a specific behavior, and we can uh, take all that information to correlate brain anatomy with behavior. So brain damage can cause a lot of different issues depending on what part of the brain is damaged from inability to recognize faces, inability to perceive motion, changes in emotional responses, and more. Uh, so there are a few types of damage you can have. Uh, there's an ablation, which is a removal of a brain area, a lesion, uh, which is damage to a brain area often done for research, and then there are what are called stereotaxic instruments, which specifically damage structures in the interior of the brain. So you can use this to uh, stimulate a specific part of the brain with an electrode. Uh, so, you know, if you visit a friend's house and you see them with one of these, run. So there's something called transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS, where you apply a magnetic field to a portion of the brain. And what that does is it deactivates neurons below that magnet. So basically what we do is we can activate, then inactivate, and then activate again a part of the brain, which allows us to see what that part of the brain is responsible for. And this is what it looks like. So if, you know, you're hanging out with a friend and they're like, hey, uh, put on this like weird hat that covers, uh, you know, all your hair and just put your chin on this thing real quick. Run, they're trying to TMS you. You gotta, you gotta get out there. You gotta get better friends. So stimulation of the brain should increase a specific behavior. There is something called optogenetics, which allows you to basically turn on activity in specific neurons by basically shining a laser within the brain. Uh, you have to wonder uh, where these ideas came from. It's like, what if we put lasers inside of us? What would happen? Well, optogenetics, right? So these... Uh, uh, so electrodes can probe the brain of a person undergoing brain surgery, which is important because you want to make sure that while you're cutting in uh, to fix one thing, you're not damaging other functions. Uh, so, for example, there was a violinist uh, who was undergoing brain surgery and they had that uh, musician play while they were going uh, while they were being operated on to make sure that they weren't damaging the part of their brain responsible for their skill, right? Uh, so the limitation of this is that uh, complex behaviors depend on activity in many parts of the brain. Uh, so just focusing on one specific part might not allow you to understand how one specific thing could be, like a specific behavior that's complex could be affected. EEGs, or electroencephalographs, record the electrical activity produced by various brain regions. Uh, so basically, they're looking at the activity. Uh, and so sometimes what's happening is somebody might say, oh, this doesn't affect me. But we see a little spike in their EEG, which means that their brain is doing something. Uh, they can sometimes do... Like, so for example, let's say um, you um, you show somebody who's like desensitized to violence a whole bunch of different like violent images. So uh, maybe you start with like a baseline. So like a cute puppy, uh, a cute cat, uh, a kid with ice cream and balloons, right? Uh, so you see normal brain activity and you're like, oh, are you feeling anything? I'm like, no, I don't feel anything. Uh, and then you show them like a, a gruesome car accident, right? Uh, and then you ask them at that point, did they feel anything? And they're like, no, I didn't feel anything, right? But their brain actually showed a response. So 
it can actually show things that people aren't even aware that their brain was processing. If your friend walks in and tries to put one of these on your head, stay. Actually, that would be really fun. That's a cool friend. We also have the magnetoencephalograph, the MEG. It is similar to the EEG, but it measures the uh, magnetic fields that are generated by the brain. Uh, we also have positron emission tomography, uh, the PET or PET, uh, which records emission of radioactivity from injected ra radioactive chemicals. Uh, so basically what they do is they give you a little uh, syringe filled with uh, I don't know how to draw syringes, uh, something like that, uh, <laughs> filled with radioactive goo. Uh, and basically what it does is it's hanging out in your bloodstream. Uh, and when your brain is doing stuff, this is your brain on drugs, uh, blood is going to flow to the areas that are more active. So if you're listening to music and your temporal lobe uh, is really processing everything that's happening, then we'll see uh, blood going to this area. The PET can see that radioactive blood. It's not super radioactive, it's just like a little, little bitty radioactive. Uh, so we can uh, see that activity and then we can go, oh, so when people listen to music, this part of the brain lights up. So here's a, a Meg and we can see different uh, levels of brain activity following a tone, right? Uh, so look at these big spikes of uh, a response over here. Uh, and over here, there's not so much. What is over here? What are these areas that might be responding to this audio information? Could it possibly be the temporal lobes? It possibly could be. Uh, you figured it out all on yourself all on yourself is that the is that what people say all on your own and here's a pet scanner this is not what you put your cats and dogs in to tell you whether or not it's a cat or a dog it's not that kind of pet scanner uh this is going to allow us to see where that a uh, little radioactive ooze is going in your brain. It, it sounds a lot scarier. If I say radioactive ooze, something about ooze just makes it uh, <laughs> worse. Uh, so I'm just going to say that for the rest of my time teaching. Uh, it's basically putting radioactive ooze just in your brain. It's fine. Don't worry about it. We also have the fMRI, the Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It's a different version of an MRI that looks at oxygen consumption in your brain, uh, and it allows you to see uh, how things move and change over time. It is safer and less expensive than a PET, so no radioactive ooze. It's just depending on the oxygen that's already in your brain. And basically, you compare uh, brain pictures while the person is engaged in a specific activity, uh, which allows us to understand uh, kind of like, okay, well, if the brain, if this part of the brain isn't active when or as active when they're, you know, thinking about their favorite baseball players, but it is active uh, when they uh, are, you know, playing baseball or trying to catch a ball, you know, what, what does that necessarily mean. So uh, by looking at how things change from activity to activity, we can better understand how different parts of the brain are related to different activities. And here's an fMRI. Fun fact about the fMRI machine, uh, don't bring anything metal into the room. Uh, they use very powerful magnets. Uh, so if you have piercings, that would not be a good thing to keep. Uh, if you left your cell phone in the room, there have been people who have brought in metal chairs 
to uh, like an fMRI room and they turned it on not remembering that it uses very powerful magnets and they have not only destroyed the chair but the thousands upon thousands of dollars costing machine so if you're around an fMRI make sure no metal just in case you were wondering uh, I did Google it to see if I were to buy an FM, FM RI machine, how much would it cost? Uh, on the low end, you're looking at like $20,000 for a used one, just a used one. Uh, if you are looking for like uh, a nice, a nicer one, you might be spending up to, you know, like $700,000. So don't bring your metal into the machine. So this isn't actually how it would work, but just to give you an idea with some made up numbers, uh, let's say you have two different tasks, right? So your experimental task and then the comparison task. So maybe the experimental task is very hard math. And then the comparison task is just, you know, uh, reading different numbers uh, out loud, right? Uh, so the, uh, or even not even reading them out loud, just like reading a list of numbers. So both of those involve the part of the brain that is going to be responsible for understanding numbers, but only one requires you to do calculations. So you would look at the difference in activation between these two parts of the brain and find the part that had the biggest difference. If there's a part with a big difference between two different tasks, then that means that that uh, difference, that area, is responsible very likely for the skills needed in the experimental task. Back in the day, uh, there were people who tried to correlate the brain shape with uh, behavior. Uh, they were looking at lumps on the skull uh, and seeing, and they kind of made these predictions about how the shape of the skull was related to certain personality traits. This was called phrenology. They were so close, <laughs> but they got it very wrong. It's not actually uh, the shape of the skull. Uh, it is specific lobes of the brain. So here's a little map of the brain according to phrenologists. Uh, friendly reminder, <laughs> this is not accurate, so please do not memorize this. Uh, so we have it split into affective and intellectual uh, faculties. Uh, so, you know, uh, if area 19 was big, maybe you had a lot of uh, ideality, right? Uh, if, uh, you know, 28 was a little bigger than other parts, and maybe you really enjoyed order, you know. Uh, that is what they thought. Uh, it was a really good guess, but it was unfortunately incorrect. So now we identify peculiar behaviors and look for abnormal brain structures or function. So if something seems off, we try to see if we can find a actual anatomical match to that weird behavior. Uh, and we can find that using CAT scans or MRIs. So a CAT, computerized axial tomography, injects a little dye into the blood. And uh, sorry, I always laugh when I describe these things because if you, like, we're trying to pitch this to somebody where you're just like, okay, I've got an idea. We're going to put dye in people's blood and we're going to rotate them around while shooting radiation at their head. And then we're just going to make a picture of their brain. Uh, but that's what we do. Uh, so they rotate the scanner super slowly until the measurements have been taken at each angle and then the computer is able to construct an image. And that allows us to uh, identify tumors and any abnormalities in the brain. And then, as mentioned before, 
MRIs apply a magnetic field in order to uh, make an image of the brain. So here we can see the CT scanner, right? That slow rotation uh, of the X-ray source and the X-ray decoder, right? Uh, in order to make this map of the brain. And here we have a map of the brain created by an MRI. So there are lots of ways of studying the relationship between the brain and behavior. So we can look at and see what happens to somebody after they have a stroke. Where they have a stroke is going to affect their behavior. Uh, we could look at lesions and ablations, right? We can do TMS or we can stimulate the brain through an electrode or we can uh, record brain activity during behavior. Uh, there are a lot of ways that we can understand how the brain works and different things are going to give us different types of information. The more information we can take into consideration, the better we're going to understand the brain. And then of course, all the other methods that we discussed before, EEGs, MEGs, PETs, fMRIs, CATs, and MRIs, all of these are ways of just studying how different parts of the brain are related to specific behaviors. So that was a lot. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if you can tell that my voice is tired from trying to record this lecture. Uh, so a lot of talking from me, a lot of listening <laughs> from you. So I'm sorry. This class is a lot of information. So make sure you're taking it at a uh, like fair pace. Uh, once if you're listening and you start tuning out, take a break. Uh, if you are the type of person who listened to this thing all the way through, no issues, you've already memorized everything, I, you might be a robot. Uh, no offense, no, not saying that that's a bad thing, just saying you might be a robot. Uh, but uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we'll, you know, get ready to quiz be quizzed on it uh and we'll talk soon because there are several more chapters all right bye